to Mark chapter 12 as we continue looking at the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 12 will be in verses 38 through 44 this morning. If you would bow with me. Dear God, as we come at this time, Lord, and we just heard about remembering the cross, remembering your love for us, Lord, love that you have revealed. Lord, you have provided the way for us to come here today to know you, to worship you. In our relationship with you, Lord, we pray that our hearts and minds would be open, that the Holy Spirit will allow us to hear your word and be changed by it. May this moment, may this time be about you. We pray this in the name of our God and King Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I will make just a small confession to you guys. You probably already know this about me, but I am a type of guy who loves to make lists. I like to make a list of everything that I have to do, but I don't like making the list. What I like doing is checking things off my list. Nothing makes me feel more accomplished than when I get to check something off of my list. It, to me, it's like conquering the world. It's like the moon landing. I love, I mean, I will put things on my list that I've already done just so I can check it off. When I'm checking things off, I like to make a big deal out of it. I will start humming the theme song to the Olympics. Dun, 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 I love it. And you might think you have an issue, Brad, and you may be right, but I know a lot of you are just like me. I know you. You make lists. You like checking stuff off. You like feeling accomplished. And the neat thing is, is that even though we didn't land on the moon, it's just as good. I mean, it feels just as good to us. And personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with it until we start applying that concept to our relationship with Christ. Till we bring the list to our day-to-day relationship with Christ. Quiet time, check. Serve on a ministry or committee, check. Attend church, check. Tithing, check. We feel like as long as we can check things off, then we have been a good Christian. We've done what we're supposed to do, and therefore God is happy with us. And what we fail to understand that God is really not concerned about our actions until he first has our heart. See, it's more than just about what you do. It's why you do it that really makes the difference. And that's what we're going to see in our passage today. In Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44, what Jesus is going to teach, that it's just not about what you do, but why you do it that makes the difference to him. We're going to take this passage, we'll divide it up into three parts. We'll talk about the warning, the example, and the point. The warning, the example, and the point. And then we'll talk about how it applies to each of us today. And if you're a Christian, what you should get from this or what you wish you understand is that the why of what you do is important to the king. The why of what you do is important to him. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, what this passage should help you understand is that Jesus Christ gave his all for you on the cross, and he did it because he loves you. And today, he's inviting you to know that love and live forever through that love in his presence. So as we begin this morning, let me give you a little bit of background or context for our passage, so we kind of understand how everything's flowing right now in the book of Mark. Our passage is in the gospel according to Mark. It is an account of the gospel, which means it's a telling of the good news. And this good news is that Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross, offers to anyone who comes to him through faith rescue from their separation from God. And what Mark is saying is this, is how you respond to Jesus makes all the difference. If you understand that, then you understand what Mark is saying from beginning to end. Now, our passage is in the larger section that begins in chapter 11, verse 1, and goes to chapter 13, verse 37. And it falls during the Passion Week, that last week of Jesus' death, burial, last week of his earthly ministry before his death, burial, and resurrection. 
It all begins on Sunday with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and he goes around to the temple and looks around. Continues on Monday as he goes back to the temple, and he kicks out the, the, the money changers and those who are selling sacrificial animals in the court of Gentiles. And then he gets back up on Tuesday, and he goes back to the temple on Tuesday. He's confronted with the religious leaders. They see him as a threat to the status quo. They see him as a threat uh, to their way of life, to their control. And so they want Jesus gone. And so their plan is to trap him, to try to make him say something that would make the crowds turn on him or, or to say something that they could arrest him for. And so they question him. They question him on his authority. They try to get him to say something blasphemous. They question him uh, about uh, the afterlife and about taxes, but it doesn't work. And here's where it starts to turn. In verse 28, there's a scribe who comes to Jesus and asks a question out of humility, a question out of sincerity. And he says, Jesus, when you take everything in the law, when you take everything that's in the, what we call the Old Testament and you put it all together and wrap it into a ball, well, what, is the, what is the law? What is the precept? What is the commandment? What is the, uh, the one thing that we're supposed to do that summarizes it all? Jesus, summarize for us what it means to have a relationship with God. And Jesus doesn't hesitate. He says, first, you love God with all that you are and all that you have with your soul, your strength, and your mind. There's nothing like him. He's unique. He's the only one. So love him like that. And out of your love for God, love others sacrificially. Love them like you love yourself. This is what it means. This is what you do. This is, this is how uh, your relationship with God impacts your life. Now, if you love God and love others, it'll impact the way that you live and impact the way you treat those around you. And then Jesus begins to stop taking questions and asking them. And through questions, he begins to teach about himself. He says, you guys got to understand that as the Messiah, as the son of David, I'm not just a man. And I'm not just a political leader. And I'm not a military leader. And I have not come to make Israel great again. I have come to die as a ransom for many. Because I am God the Son. And so as we pick up the story in verses 38 through 40, we see that Jesus now gives a warning. In verses 38 through 40, Jesus gives a warning. It's still Tuesday. Jesus is still teaching. And in the middle of his teaching, he gives a warning to not be like the scribes, the teachers of the law. So who are these scribes? Who are these teachers of the law? Well, understand that their job was pretty simple. Their calling was simple. They were to know what we call the Old Testament. They were to know the law. They were to know God's word. They were to be able to study it, know it, and live it out. And in knowing it and studying and living it out, they were also supposed to preserve it, and they were supposed to teach it to those around them. So they would live out God's word. They would obey God's word. They would make meticulous copies of God's word to give for people so they could read it. And then they would teach it to them so they could understand it. That was their job. So how does something so God-centered go so wrong in such a hurry where Jesus is saying, beware and do not be like these guys? Where did it go wrong? Well, the bottom line is, is that their heart was the problem. You see, these guys, in studying God's Word, they should have known that all of the precepts, all of the laws, all the understanding is that you're supposed to love God before everything else. Love God supremely and love others sacrificially. If anybody knew this, these guys were supposed to know this, but they didn't because they didn't love God with all of their heart. They didn't love God above everything else. They did not love others sacrificially. Who did they love? They loved themselves. And that's what Jesus is saying in verses 38 and 40. He's saying their actions show what they love. Their actions show that they don't love God above everything else. Their actions show that they don't love God sacrificially. Their actions show that they love them them. They love themselves. 
And Jesus says, look at them. They walk around in long flowing robes. They have fringes on the bottom. And these outfits are to get people's attentions. They're like peacocks. It's like wearing a, a lighted up sign that says, look at me, I'm here. Jesus says they go into the marketplace and they demand, they expect to have special titles of master, father, rabbi. That when they come into the synagogues to worship, when they, when they come into the banquet places, they want seats that are special. You know, the birthday seats, they have balloons on them and stringers hanging off the back, you know? So when everybody knows that they're the special people who are there and so they can have attention. And when they pray, they love for people to hear them. They hear how wonderful they are, how intelligent they are, how holy they are. Jesus says their main job is to love God and their main job is to show that love. Their main God is, job is to glorify God and their main job is to point people back to God. But what they do is glorify themselves and bring attention to themselves. Jesus says, hey, beware of those guys. Don't be like them. But it's just not the fact that they love themselves more than they love God. They love themselves more than they love others. And that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 40. He says, they devour widows' homes. We're not really sure what that means. But we do know that, that in that time period, there's quite a bit of injustices that were going on with the scribes and the teachers of the law. They, they would sponge off the generosity of, of widows. They would cheat and mishandle their estates uh, as their legal guardians. Uh, they would um, um, actually require financial uh, um, uh, um, compensation for their work, even though they weren't supposed to get it. So we're not really sure what that means, but this is what we can tell. They were taking advantage of the needy and the vulnerable. And we know in the Old Testament and passages like Isaiah 10 verses 1 through 4 that God doesn't like that. He's not on board with that. The people they should have been protecting, the people they should have been loving sacrificially, the people they should have been teaching to know who God is and how to obey God and follow God was the ones that they were taking advantage of. And Jesus says, beware. Don't be like them. And then in verse 40, Jesus lets us know why we need to beware, why we need to be like them. Because in verse 40, Jesus says, because I'm going to hold them accountable. I'm going to hold them accountable. I'm going to hold them accountable because they know better. They know what God expects of them to love him and to love others sacrificially. I'm going to hold them accountable because they know that in their job, they are to grow closer to God and bring people closer to God. I'm going to hold them accountable because they know better. And so what Jesus is saying is this, is that revelation brings responsibility. That you are held accountable for what you know. And that's exactly what Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 48. He says, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. You see, the teachers of the law, the scribes, if anyone else knew that they were to love God supremely and love others sacrificially, and the way they love God supremely would be to know the law, study the law, obey the law, preserve the law, live out the law, and the way they would love others sacrificially is teach people how to do the exact same thing, but they didn't. They glorified themselves, and they took advantage of those around them. And Jesus says, beware. Don't be like them. They know better. I'm going to hold them accountable. 
So Jesus gives a warning. He says, these are the folks you're not supposed to be like. But then in verses 41 through 44, Jesus gives us the example. He says, this is the one you need to be like. See, those scribes, those teachers of the law, they don't love God above everything else, and they do not love people sacrificially. Don't be like them. But let me give you an example of someone who does. So in verse 41, we do have a scene change, a small scene change. Jesus goes to the temple treasury, which is in the court of women. The court of women was a place that Jewish men and women were allowed to go, and in the court of women were collection chests, 13 of these chests, for uh, the temple, for offerings. Now, these offerings that were collected were used for the upkeep of the temple. They were also used for keep that sacrifices going. Both things would help out with worship. And they were also used to help out with with ministries for the needy, for the poor, for for orphans and widows. I think I could bind those together, whiffins, uh, orphans and widows together. I don't know if that's possible. I think I made a new word. So what was collected there was really for ministry, really for, for, to do, keep doing worship and, and, and ministry. We know there were about 13 chests in, there in this time during Herod's, second, uh, Herod's temple, the second temple. We know that these 13 collection chests were generally called shofaros because they resembled the shofar, the, the ram's horn that was blown during times of worship for Israel. That when you would come and throw in your collection, there was an opening kind of like the bell of a trumpet, and then you had the neck of it go down a little bit slender, and it would feed into a collection box. And so when you put money into it, it would clank and clamor down until it fell in. Understand the more money you put in, the more noise it would create. The more noise that you would create, the more attention you would bring to yourself. So Jesus goes and sits and he watches. And we see there's some people who are well off there who are financially stable. And what we see in verse 41 where most English translations say they were putting their money into the offering plate or or these collection chests, literally in the New Testament language, is that they threw it in. So keep in mind, the more money you put in, the more noise you make. The more money you throw in, it's going to be a lot more noise. And so you're throwing it in, it's clanking, it's clamoring down, and it's screaming, look at me, look at me. The noise must have been brilliant. It must have been deafening. And then Jesus sees a widow who has two copper coins, two mites, two lepta. Do know that a lepton was actually the smallest currency in circulation in Palestine during this time. It was the smallest physically and also financially. It was about 1 64th of a denarius, and a denarius was a day's wage. So it was 1 64th of a day's wage. During this time period, two lepta could actually probably buy a handful of flour, which would have been enough maybe for one person for one meal on one day. It's not a lot of money. So you hear this clanking and this clamoring. The noise must have been deafening in there. And then somehow the silent offering of this widow grabs Jesus' attention. And Jesus cries the 12 over in verse 43. He says, look at this lady. Look at this widow. Look at what she's done. She's given all that she has. She has given the more. And if you've been in the church long enough, you know this is a great VBS passage, and it's a great passage that we talk about in Sunday school. And every pastor in the world comes to this when they're doing a building program because what we want you to do is give to the hurts financially, right? She gave all that she had. Therefore, that's the kind of giver that God wants. So you've got to give financially till it hurts. That's what the Scripture says. But is that really what Jesus is saying? I mean, I know we teach it that way, but is that really what he's saying? When you see it in the context of this passage, when you see it that Jesus has been talking about the greatest commandments of loving God and loving others, and Jesus has been talking about his identity, and Jesus has been talking about don't be like the scribes because they don't do it, and then he points out this widow, is it really about giving financially till it hurts? Or maybe there's something else. I'll tell you, there is something else. Jesus' point is not to give till it hurts financially. Jesus' point is to know why you're giving. His 
point is that it's all about the heart. The why of what we do is always loving God and loving others. That's the point that he's making. And if you see this in context, if you see this in everything we've been talking about since verse 28, it all makes sense. If you see it in the context of what Jesus has been teaching, a scribe comes to Jesus out of sincerity and humility, and he says, Jesus, what is the, the life of a believer? What is the life of a follower of God? What is it that we're supposed to do? What is our relationship supposed to be like? And Jesus, without hesitation, says, love God. Love him with everything. He is unique. He is one. There's nothing like him. He stands alone. Therefore, you should love him with all that you are and all that you have, with your heart and your soul, your mind, your body, because that's what he deserves. Give him everything. And out of your love for him, you love others. Why? Because he loves them. He created them in his image, and he calls you to. You love them sacrificially. You love them above yourself. And he says, if you do this, it will impact your life. It'll impact the way that you live. It'll impact the way you treat others around you. It will show in your actions and your attitudes. And Jesus says, by the way, actions and attitudes. Let's talk about the scribes over here. These guys know this. These guys are supposed to do this. They're supposed to glorify God, but they glorify themselves. They're supposed to love others sacrificially. They take advantage of those around them. They're not the example. But look at this lady. Look at what she's doing. It's not about the amount. It's about her heart. She is giving out of love. She is giving out of devotion. She's giving as an act of worship. She's giving because she knows it'll take care of others. She gives because she loves God and loves others. And Jesus is saying, that's the point. It's not about the what, it's about the why. Why do we do it? Listen, we need to be, under, we need to be clear. We need to understand. You see, those folks that were there giving in the temple that way with all the clanking and the clamoring, they were giving their tithe. They were giving their offering. They were meeting their duty. They could check off the list and said, I've done what I'm supposed to do. But Jesus says, no. You're doing the what, but you've missed the why. It's about your glory. You gotta understand the teachers of the law, they still taught. They still went to the synagogue to worship. They still went to the banquets. They were doing their duty. They could check it off and say, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And Jesus say, no, because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You're wise about you. It's not about God. It's not about others. And he got this lady. She's not there out of duty. She's not there to bring attention to herself. She's not there for her glory. She's there because she loves God and she loves others. And Jesus says, that's the one. And what we need to understand that if we do anything for ourself, for our glory, then it means nothing in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how much you serve. It doesn't matter how much you attend. It doesn't matter how much you volunteer. It doesn't matter how much you teach the Bible. If it's not for God's glory, if it's not for the love of others, then it means nothing in his kingdom. That's the point. The why matters. Because if you're doing it for you, it's legalism. If you're doing it for you, then you've got your reward. If you're not doing it for him, it really doesn't matter. That's the point. So, if we understand that's the point of what Jesus has been saying, then the question that we need to ask is, you know, what does this mean for us? How does this apply for us? Christian, what you need to understand is what you love is going to come out in your actions. What you love is going to come out in your actions. If it's not because you love God and love others, it's, it's going to show, it's going to come out. If it's about you, it's going to come out. Back in 2014, 
there's a lady, 31-year-old lady by the name of Grace Gelder that made international headlines. She was in London. She made international headlines because she married herself. And you heard me correctly. She legally married herself. The Guardian newspaper in London said this, Mrs. Gelder proposed to herself on a park bench, bought a ring and a dress, and invited all of her friends to watch her make vows. Gelder said in the interview, the day was obviously centered on me. The final event being a mirror for me to kiss me. The story was picked up by the late show with Seth Meyers. And Seth Meyers said, Mrs. Gelder, I don't know how to tell you this, but the lady you just married, she might be crazy. I think she gives fruitcakes a bad name. Yeah, she's a nut, but let's understand, she is a great example of how our actions show what we love. She loves herself, and therefore her actions show it. And Christian, we need to ask the question, what do our actions show about us? What does it show that we love? So here's a couple hard questions, and I would encourage you not to pass over these questions. So these questions may help you understand where you're at today, and I do think we need to ask them. First question is, why are you here right now? Why did you come? Because this is what you're supposed to do? You were made to do it? Out of duty? Obligation? Responsibility? Because you want to hang out with people like you, people that you like. Why do you do what you do? Why are you here? Or did you come this morning to worship the one who gave his life as a ransom for you and has given you life and eternal life and loves you more than you understand? The why matters. Why do you serve on a committee? Why do you serve on a ministry? Because you're the only one who can get it right? Because you like being in control? That no one else will do it? Out of duty, out of obligation? Or do you do it because you love God and love others? And we'll provide that opportunity for folks to grow in Him. The why matters. Why do you read your Bible and pray? Duty? Obligation? To be able to check it off our list? Or because you know you're desperate for His presence in your life? The why matters. Why do you tithe? Why do you give? Obligation, duty, it's expected. Or because you know that everything you have came from him and you just want to give a little back as a way of thank you and worship. The why matters. And maybe we're sitting here, we're mulling this over and we're going, listen, you know, maybe it's more about self. Maybe it is about self-promotion. Maybe I like getting pats on the back. Maybe I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. So, so what am I supposed to do to fix this? What am I supposed to do so that, that I can love God and, and love others? You know, what, what can I do? Do I need to try harder? Do, do I need to do better? And here we go. This is where we like to pull out our checklist. What book do I need to read? What class do I need to take? Well, what program, what seminar? Tell me what I need to do so I can check it off my list so I can be okay with God and be what I'm supposed to be. Because we want the checklist because the checklist is easy. And what we fail to understand that in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ, it's just that, it's a relationship. And like any relationship, like a friendship, like a marriage, it requires time and it requires attention and it requires focus and it requires communication. It requires you to be all in. You can't put it on a checklist. And if you don't believe me, husbands, I challenge you, make a checklist. 
I'll tell my wife I love her once a day, check. I'll take out the garbage if I'm told to, check. Hey, listen. It's a relationship that you spend time in his presence, praying and reading your Bible. You spend time focusing on him, learning to hear him, learning to walk with him, where you spend that focus and he grows you over time. And the amazing thing is that as you grow over time, understanding his love for you, then you will pour out loving God and loving others. It begins with you running after him, him revealing himself to you, and it pours out all around you naturally. It's not a checklist. It's about focus. It's about relationship. It's about attention. Done day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade. You know, that's what Paul has given us the understanding for when he talks in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. He says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through the, his Holy Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How does your life be about the why? It's not a checklist. It's not a one-time decision. It's a daily relationship in which you give him your focus and your attention. You read his word, you study his word, you pray. And in that relationship, there builds a closeness you learn to hear him, you learn to understand him. You begin to understand the love of Christ. Paul says it, it fills you with the goodness of God. And in that, it spills out to where your actions are because you love him and love others. If you want your why to be about loving God and loving others, Christian, I'm sorry. There's no checklist. It's a daily decision to have a relationship with the king. And if you'll run after him, he will take care of the rest. That's what a relationship is. If you want to make your why about loving him and loving others, then you need to focus on him. So the question also now comes to me, what does this mean for those who are not Christians? What about you? Well, Adrian Crezzo is a writer, and she writes of a true story that takes place in Italy. It's a story about a woman named Corinne Ward. Corinne Ward was a struggling actress, and, and she one day received a phone call from a local attorney saying that the local doctor, Dr. Mezaros, had passed away suddenly and made her the sole beneficiary to his estate. She didn't understand this. She went and met with the, the local attorney, and said, listen, I knew Dr. Mezaros kind of in passing. Everybody kind of did. You know, he was one of the doctors in town, but I, I didn't know him that well, to be honest with you. We, we didn't have any type of relationship. And the attorney says, I know. Dr. Mezaros met you about a decade ago and fell madly in love with you. And he never could get over you, could never move on. But he also had this debilitating fear in which he could never talk to you. And so for the last decade, he did not know how to show his love. He did not know how to speak of his love. He never got up the nerve to come tell of you of his love. And so it was a love unfulfilled. It was a love that was never spoken of, a love that was never shown until timely it really was too late. 
This morning, if you're not a Christian, you you may feel like you relate to that story because you're saying, you know what, I feel like Corinne and I feel like God is Dr. Meseros. That God may love me, but he loves me from a distance. He loves me mysteriously. He's never shown me that love. He's never revealed to me that love to really make it known to me. And I will tell you, you're completely wrong. God has shown you his love. And that love he's revealed to you is through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. 1 John 4, chapter uh, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 says that in this way God showed his love toward us, that he sent his son into the world, that through him we might have life. This is love, not that we love God, but he loves us and gave us his son to be an atoning sacrifice for his sins. God loves you. And in his love for you, God the Son came and died on the cross for your sin and your rebellion, paid a price that you cannot pay so that you can come to him in faith and have a relationship with him forever. God's love for you is not like Dr. Meseros. God's love for you is like the widow at the temple who gave all that she had. Jesus Christ gave all that he had for you on the cross because he loves you. As the widow gave everything that she had because of her love for God, God has given all that he has for you through Jesus Christ's death on the cross because he loves you. And in that love, God is inviting you to stop running away from him and to turn back and to come to him believing that Jesus is sufficient for forgiveness, sufficient for your salvation, sufficient for your reconciliation. And if you do that, he will rescue you. And you will experience his love like you never have before. God loves you. And Jesus' death on the cross proves it. Accept that love and come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. So as we come to the end of the text, the question is, how do we respond right now? How do we respond at this moment? And I will tell you, as we hear about Jesus and we understand more about his teaching right now, I think the only way to respond is to let love be your why. Let love be your why. This morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, the question is, why does God reach out to me? Why did Jesus die on the cross? The answer is love. That's the why. He did because he loves you. So today, you need to accept his offer to come to him through faith in Christ, accepting that love. Just a few moments, we'll have the invitation. It's a time that you're just invited to respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you. And I do believe the Holy Spirit is making it clear in a way that you understand that you're separated from God because of your sin and his offer to come to him through faith in Christ. You'll be standing, you'll be singing during that time as the Holy Spirit moves you. I encourage you to come forward. We'll be down here waiting for you. We'd love to talk to you more about Christ. Christian, how do you that love be your why? Why do you serve? Why do you attend? Why do you give? Why do you teach? Because if it's not for the glory of Jesus Christ, if it's not for the love of others, then it means nothing in his kingdom. So as we come into the invitation, I encourage you to lay before your God and King and say, tell me. Holy Spirit, let me know. Because Christian, I promise you, if you're open to the Holy Spirit, he'll let you know everything very clearly. And what is it if if God reveals that your, your heart's not where it should be? It's an easy process. Number one, you just say, you know what, God, forgive me. I'm wrong. And number two, you say, I'm running after you. I know it's not a 10-step plan. I know I can't do it in a week, but I want that relationship. I want that daily relationship of studying your word, of praying, of growing closer to you so I can learn to hear you and walk with you. I may not know everything, but I'm running after that. If you do it, he'll take care of the rest. As you're praying through that, if you need help or encouragement, Altar's open. We're here waiting for you. We'll be glad to pray with you and encourage you. Or you can pray with those beside you. No matter who you are today, 
Let love be your why. Let the love of Christ fill your understanding and overflow in your life. Allow his love to change everything. Father, we praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the ability to know you, to love you, to serve you. And Lord, we have been created for your glory. We have been saved, Father, for your love. We, Lord, are kept because of your righteousness. Lord, do not let us ever think it's about us. May we live to love you and love others. And may that love naturally flow out of us because we know your love for us. Allow us to see different, be different, live differently. May it be for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No matter who you are this morning, I invite you just to listen to the Holy Spirit. This is what the invitation is all about. No matter what he's telling you, the answer is yes. We're waiting for you. Altar's open. You can pray with those beside you. Would stand. Worship with us during this time.